Hi everyone, welcome to the final plenary talk of the Lit Student Conference. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Paul Tabuada. He is the Vijay K. P. Professor of Engineering in the University of California in Los Angeles. He works in the Cyber Physical Systems Laboratory. Uh, Professor Tabuada's contributions to cyber physical systems have been recognized by multiple awards, including the NSF Career Award, the Don Ekman Award, the George Axelby Award, the Greater Fellow by IEEE, and many other awards. He currently serves as the chair of HSCC's steering committee and has served on the editorial board of the IEEE Embedded Systems Letters and the IEEE Transactions on Automatic Control. Please welcome Professor Paul. So let me start with the disclaimer in that my talk will be somewhat speculative. There are going to be some nuggets of technical work, but there's going to be a big gap between the things I'll establish formally and the places where I would like to go. Uh, so feel free to ask questions, and you know, many of you perhaps are just in the early stages of your PhD, so uh, it would be great if you find some of these ideas interesting and you want to carry them out uh, further. So this was work that started when I was uh, in a project with Aaron Ames, faculty at Caltech and Jesse Grizzle, faculty at uh, Michigan and then you know, took his own course. But in the beginning, when we were thinking about the problem, there were lots of discussions between ourselves and uh, our students. So let me start with the motivation for data-driven control. Um, there are many good reasons to do model-based design. In fact, if you open a textbook in control, the first chapters will be chapters about modeling because the model is extremely important and your design is based on the model. But I've always wondered how much of a model do you really need? Because we know that models are wrong and it seems to make no sense that we design systems based on models that you know are wrong, but then we still expect them to work when the design is applied in a model different from the one that we used for design. Um, I always wondered, to which extent does the model need to be accurate? How much modeling do we really need to do in order to get an answer to the problem? So that's one motivation. And here I'll talk about controlling systems without the model. So I'm going to be perhaps a little bit too extreme. But the hope is that in doing this exercise, it will, it will shed some light into how much of a model do we really need to control the system. Now, another um, reason for looking into these problems has to do with autonomy. And in the context of autonomy, machine learning is having a considerable impact, especially when you deal with sensors such as vision and lighters and so on. Uh, but how about related control problems? So what happens when you, you want to give formal guarantees of performance or safety, for example, and you want to have machine learning components in the loop? Um, I'm sure all of you have seen examples of where things go wrong. Uh, each one has our favorite examples. I'll show you two here, and then I'll talk in a little bit more detail about a third one. So here's an example of a Uber car that decides to run over a red light. So that light there is going to turn red. Everybody stops. Everything looks fine. The person starts to cross, and there goes a Uber that just thought this was not a red light. Here's an example of Volvo. So these are journalists. This is, this is an event just for the journalists, and Volvo is showing their safety features of their cars, that they're supposed to <coughs> find obstacles and automatically brake whenever there's an obstacle. In this case, that, that, that truck over there. <laughs> and it sometimes doesn't work. Okay, but so these are examples coming from industry and we can see the videos, but we don't really understand the reasons as why, why this happened. So I'll talk about another example that I have some experience with. So I was doing some work for, uh, for a defense contractor and they told me, well, you know, I want you to give formal guarantees on the code that is implementing these things on the satellite and make sure that none of these things that, that we saw in this example before occurred. And so they pointed me to this report detailing what happened in a DARPA study. So in 2007, uh, DARPA conducted this flight test where they sent a small satellite that was supposed to dock on a big satellite. And they wanted to study the feasibility of both delivering materials as well as doing inspections or doing repairs in the outside part of an older, bigger satellite. And something went wrong, and then after that, they asked NASA to do a report to detail what happened, and the report gives you a chronology of all the things that went wrong, and I'll quickly go over them. Uh, 
So at some point, the sensor, failed, the sensor computer failed. The chaser is a small satellite that was supposed to dock when it was 10 meters away from the target. Then there was a backup plan. There was a pre-planned emergency maneuver. They switched to this maneuver uh, in order to place the, the satellite in a, in a safe position. Now, when they were doing the safe maneuver, sensor data was not available. The only data that was available was coming from the camera, but there was a piece of code saying that the camera is only to be used whenever you're pointing uh, to the satellite where you want to dock because it was far away. They just discarded this data. No other data was available. And uh, at some point, the infrared sensor started to work again, but because their state estimator had diverged, he thought that this data was an outlier and rejected the only data that was correct and that was coming into the system. So ground operations saw this thing happening. They just decided to put the chaser in coast mode, and it drifted for one day. There it goes, 2.5 kilometers away. Uh, they tried to stop the drift, but there was all kinds of problems that were occurring. It drifted even more, six kilometers, and then uh, they had to deal with the fact that there were all these assumptions that were baked into the system that had to do with the configuration of the sun, uh, the amount of glare they would get from the sun, all these pre-baked assumptions that were no longer satisfied. They had to contend with all of this, and they could only recover it after eight days. So why am I bringing this example? Because perception is extremely important. You could have the best control algorithm, you could formally verify the code and the implementation of your control algorithm, but if the inputs that go into your control algorithm are wrong, the, the decisions end up being wrong. And this is typically where machine learning modules are used in the context of autonomous systems, in the perception pipeline. So, this leads to the question, do you really need to put all this effort into estimating the state? Do we need to know the state? How about if we just control directly from sensor data, and therefore we obviate the need to have these machine learning algorithms? Um, I don't work in machine learning, neither in perception, so I'm free to dream and to say all of these things and to suggest all of these things that may be infeasible, but hopefully the process of trying to understand this may give us ideas and may lead us into new directions. Uh, in this particular case, you could simply say that, well, if we know where we're supposed to talk, maybe perhaps I just want to control the image I'm receiving on my camera so that it aligns to the image that I'm expecting to see, and I couldn't care less about the state and what's happening elsewhere and trying to model all those things or learning those things. So here's another example that I'll come back to at the end uh, of uh, this talk. We have a little car that is just measuring distance to the side of the road. This could be done with the camera, infrared, something else. And without having a model for the car, without prior learning or anything, I'll explain how we can control the car to stay in the center of the lane without the model of the car, without even knowing which sensors are being used. So that would be the ultimate objective. Oops. Okay. Now there's a certain, uh, a third uh, reason why I got interested in this problem, and it is these papers that Michel Fleece has been writing for the past 10 or 15 years that go under the name of intelligent PID control. Uh, even though the word PID is there, this is to be used for nonlinear, uh, in fact, unknown nonlinear systems. There's no linearity assumption here. And uh, if you have not read these papers, uh, it's, no, uh, there's one you should take a look, especially with a title like this, Model Free Control and uh, Intelligent PID Controllers, a possible trivialization of nonlinear control. So I saw these titles, I have to read this paper, what's going on here? So I go and I read the paper and it's just a fascinating idea. But at the same time, it struck me as being very naive. And so I was asking myself, does it really work? I mean, there's a proof there, but still it's so simple that it shouldn't, I mean, you know, this shouldn't be allowed, such a simple idea to work on nonlinear systems. <coughs> and if it works, does it work all the time? When does it work? And why does it work? So I tried to go through this and construct my own proof, which actually led me to different way of doing things, inspired but different, so that I could prove, formally prove when these techniques are guaranteed to work. So let me review intelligent PID controls so that you have an idea. Okay, so I start with a single input, single output system, nonlinear, F, G, and H are unknown nonlinear functions. Then the assumption that is made is that if I differentiate the output k times, this is going to be equal to some nonlinear function of the state. 
plus b is a non-constant times the input. So that's the assumption that appears there. And then there's another intriguing assumption. It is stated that if we sample sufficient, the system sufficiently fast, then this function is going to appear as it's changing very slowly, so we're going to treat it as a constant. <coughs> Therefore, if we treat it as a constant, here's what we can do. We measure the output. We compute the derivative, and there's a specific technique in this paper to compute the derivative that actually involves computing integrals, which is another thing that first time I read was, oh, when you compute the derivative and you compute the integral. And okay, it took some time to understand what was happening there. And then, given that I know the derivative, I know b, and I, decide, I, I was the one designing u, I can compute a. Now, how do I control this system? Well, there's that b there, I just cancel it. There's that a there, I just computed it, I canceled it as well. And then I put here a stable polynomial. Now I'm controlling the output. And look, everything was a known and nonlinear, and I just did linear systems, maybe even an undergraduate student could go and come up with this controller. And now I'm controlling a nonlinear system with no prior data, no prior training. Fantastic. I mean, this is beautiful. Why does it, does it work? Why does it work? I mean, there are proofs in the paper, but still, you we know, we'll get this feeling that it's not completely satisfied, that one doesn't have a complete understanding of what's happening. But in particular, these would let us solve the problem I described. I have an output, I just on the fly learn without not knowing what is the state, what is the model, and I'm able to control the system, which is what I would like to do. So, and if I would summarize what my objective would be, would be the following. So, I want to control a system without knowing its model. I don't want to have any prior data and I don't want to do any prior training. I don't want to talk about computing the state because I don't even have a model, I don't know what the state is. And then, ideally, I would like to use these ideas in the context of autonomy where we have these difficulties in reconstructing the state from sensor data. So, let me now explain you how do I do this. So, Again, I'm going to start with a single input, single output system. F, G, and H are unknown linear functions. Now I'm going to assume that the output has relative degree n. So this means that the system is feedback linearizable. Later I can describe how we can do this even with systems that are not feedback linearizable. Here the assumption is that it's feedback linearizable. This means that if I differentiate the output n times, uh, I know that I'm going to obtain an affine function of u. So functions alpha and beta are nonlinear functions of the state. And now, I'm going to say that I'm going to treat alpha and beta as constants, but later I'm going to provide a formal justification as why this can be done. But one key observation here that distinguishes what I'm doing from other learning techniques such as reinforcement learning is that if I would be using something like reinforcement learning, I would be trying to use explicit, learn explicitly or implicitly these functions alpha and beta. I will not do that. I will learn the value of the functions at the current state. The value of the functions is a pair of scalars. So this makes the problem much easier than learning functions because I'll need more data, I'll need to talk about functional approximation. Here I just want to need to learn two real numbers. Okay, so now if I take n equals to 2 and under the assumption that alpha and beta are constants and because I'm using a u that is piecewise constant, so I'm saying that the nth derivative is constant, so I can just integrate this to obtain this equation and I integrate it again to obtain that equation. So under this assumption that I have not justified that says that I can treat alpha and beta as constants, I can actually get this closed form expression for the evolution of the output. Now, there are two parameters I don't know, alpha and beta. Alpha is a constant parameter, so we know from undergraduate control that an integral part in the controller will reject this disturbance, so I'll just forget about the alpha. And now, here's my strategy. I want to construct an estimate of the state C. So here the state is the output and its derivatives. If the relative degree is bigger, I'll have more derivatives. So I want to estimate derivatives of the output. Then I want to estimate this beta because the beta there is a known constant. And then my control is very simple. I'll cancel beta. And then given that this is a linear model, I know how to design a linear controller. Let's put it there. Okay. The hard part will be to explain why this is going to work. I need tell you why can we treat alpha and beta as constants and why is this, why should I expect this to work? So I'll start with a simpler case, simpler case where beta is constant unknown. Okay, so here's what we do. 
So I was saying that alpha is a constant, beta is a constant, u is a constant. So I'm going to use this model that says that my acceleration is going to be a constant. Now this is a linear model, so I'll just write the fact that my observations are going to be equal to observability matrix times my state. I solve this equation, and that's how I'm going to estimate my derivatives of the output. Now the problem of estimating derivatives has been studied quite a bit in the control literature. There are several techniques. You can talk about eigen observers, you can talk about algebraic estimation, finite time estimation, and I'll try to compare what I'm doing with these techniques. So, high gain observers. Instead of solving that algebraic equation, because it's a linear system, I could write down a Luhmberger observer. If I go then inside this Luhmberger observer to make sure that the new matrix A minus LC is stable, I will, I will notice that in this these gain matrix there, I need to have terms of the form 1 over t, where t is the sum of time. When you design high gain observers, you know that your gains are of the form 1 over epsilon, 1 over epsilon squared, etc., etc. So if I just take that model and design a simple Luhmberger observer, I'm designing a high gain observer. So you can interpret what I'm doing as using a high gain observer. Now, high gain observers have a problem called the peaking phenomenon, which is you need to make them really fast, but the faster you make them, the higher will be the overshoot. And so then you need to you know, do accommodate that carefully to make sure that that doesn't create problems. Now in our case, because I'm not computing the intermediate estimates, I'm directly computing the final estimate, I don't see the overshoot, so that I don't have to worry about that when I solve this algebraic equation. High gain observers are, high, are highly sensitive to noise. Well, here the same thing is true, but what we can do is that if the estimates we're obtaining are corrupted by noise, I take more samples so that I average out the effect of noise. So that can also be handled. And there's you know, more recent work on better, more performing high-gain observers, and we did some tests and the, the, the performance is comparable. And how about algebraic estimation? Now, if you look into uh, the papers by Fliess, there's these complicated techniques of computing derivatives using integrals. There is a much simpler explanation in this paper where it is shown that those techniques boil down to the following. You construct the constructability gradient, and from the constructability gradient, if you go to a textbook on linear systems, you'll see an expression telling you how you can estimate the state using the construct constructability gradient. Essentially, you multiply it by the state. It's equal to this expression where your measurements appear. You invert the constructability gradient, and you have your estimate. So if you look at this expression, this is essentially a continuous time version of these squares. And when I solve that algebraic equation, I'm doing these squares in discrete time. This is a continuous time version. So what appears in Fliess papers, E can also be interpreted as being exactly the same thing. Now, in the specific setting we are, under those assumptions that those parameters are constant, that dynamical system is nilpotent. So the state, state transition matrix doesn't have exponentials, just has polynomials, and that's why the expressions look so simple. But essentially, that's all we're doing. OK, so let's go back to my strategy. Construct an estimate I just described. I write down a set of algebraic equations. I solve them. Construct an estimate of beta. For now, we're assuming it's known. Constructing a linear controller, this we know what to do. Uh, now we go to the question of why is this going to work? What makes this work? So, so far, we've been working with this model under the assumption that alpha and beta were constants. This is clearly wrong. We know that. So we could say that the right model is going to be this, plus a modeling error that I'm going to put there. And provided that the state remains on a compact set and for a given bounded interval of time, we can appeal to some smoothness results to show that this error term can be bounded by a function that depends on time and the distance to the origin. So the model was correct up to this error. And now all I have to do is to study the effect of this error. How do we handle the effect of these errors? What happens when we control systems with the wrong model? Well, this specific problem turns out it was solved by Andy Till and Aaron Ezich 15 years ago. So here's how they solved the problem. They said, well, you construct a controller stabilizing the approximate model, so you'll have a Lyapunov function. But the decrease of the Lyapunov function has to be very special. It has to be linearly parameterized by your sampling time. So you have not just one controller, you have a family of controllers so that you vary the sampling rate. 
And as you vary the sampling rate, the decrease is linearly parameterized by that. Why is that important? Because if I now compute the evolution of the Lyapunov function along the nonlinear system, then the extra error term appears there. If I use the bound that I alluded to before, I get this t squared term there. And if I group this, now I see that all I have to make sure is that this term here is constant. Now this term is, the, the, its value can be controlled by t, the sampling time. So if I make the sampling time sufficiently small, I have the guarantee that this term becomes positive and this is guaranteed to work. Another way of explaining this is to say that I design my controller so that it, it stabilizes the system with a linear dependence on t and all the errors I made, they have a dependence of t of a higher order. Therefore, as I make t smaller, this term, the stabilizing term, dominates all the unstabilizing terms and by sampling sufficiently fast, Using this wrong model, I am guaranteed that I can stabilize the system. So that's the key idea. But OK, so fine. Now we have an argument showing that linear techniques and very simple-minded techniques, we can have a controller that stabilizes the system. We have a proof. But still, it may not work in practice. So does it work in practice? So at the time, I was, you know, as I mentioned before, I was talking to Aaron Ames, my collaborator, and I told him, look, I have this amazing technique. I think I found the proof. Now, I want to test it on some real gadget. At the time, I didn't have a lab. Now I have a lab. In the second part of the talk, you see experiments in my lab. So I said, OK, can I put this in one of your robots? And he told me, no, my robots are too expensive for you to try this crazy idea. However, we have one that we retired that we are not using anymore, and you can put it on that one. OK. So what we said was, OK, to start, we're just going to suspend one of the legs and control the knee joint. And we didn't know, uh, so the theory tells us that if I sample fast enough, I should be able to do it, but I don't know how fast is fast, fast enough. So we did several attempts by changing the sampling time to see what would happen. And so we just uh, gave a step, uh, a step input to see what the response would be. And you see that when you go to 10 milliseconds, it was not working that well anymore. So experimentally, we saw that if the sampling time is sufficiently small, we get reasonable performance, like here, with 3 milliseconds. But as I increase the sampling time, now the mismatch, all those error terms play a bigger role, and I don't get such a good performance anymore. So at least to give step references, it worked. Then we said, can we go beyond that? Can we ask the knee joint to track a desired trajectory? So we picked a sinusoid. And let's see if we can track a sinusoid. OK, let me try again. There you go. And indeed, with no model, no data, no prior training, we can track a sinusoid. So we don't know we're, we're controlling the joint in a robot. This could be any other system with relative degree two. It just worked. And then we said, well, maybe we can do even more. So maybe what we can do is um, to make the robot walk. And to have a comparison between this technique and the techniques that were being used before, we did the following. In this joint, we used our data-driven controller. And on that joint, we used the PD controller that they have been using on his group. So there's a high-level controller that plans the desired motion for all the joints. Those commands are sent to the joints, and then there are local controllers that track them. So we were doing this tracking. And in one of them is our controller, the other one, the PD controller they were using. And we wanted to see if the robot would be able to walk. And it did walk. And I mean, so and, and if you guys have done experiments, you know that when you do experiments, things never work at the first attempt. So do you want to guess if this worked at our first attempt? It didn't. <laughs> it worked at the second attempt. And the reason was that, so we wrote the code, we sent it to Caltech, they implemented it, it didn't work because we thought that the commands were being sent directly to the motor and then they told us there's another board that takes those commands and is controlling the power electronics. Once we realized that, what we did was that we took the command of that board to go back to our algorithm because we need to know the inputs and then at the second time it worked directly. 
Now, if you compare here, so this is the PD controller. The dashed line is the reference we'd like to track. The blue line is the actual uh, motion of the joint. You see that you have good tracking on the upper part and not as good tracking on the bottom part. This is our controller and it gives us much better tracking than the controller we have been using before. Now you could say, well, that was a PD controller, so it's how hard it is to get something that is better than a PD controller. That's a fair argument. On the other hand, the gains in that PD controller have been tuned by a generation of PhD students that have been working on this problem. So that's a very good PD controller. And you know, we never looked at the problem before. We just deployed the algorithm and it worked. Okay. So now, for the case where beta is unknown, things become more complicated. The general strategy is more or less the same, but there's just quite a few more things we need to worry about. So this is the model we're working with. Now we want to worry about reconstructing both the alpha and the beta. Uh, we assume them to be constant, so I just call them Z3. That's my, my system now. Uh, and as before, we do estimation, so we can estimate uh, y1, y2, and this z3 that appears there. So if I know z3, now my, my problem becomes, if I have measurements or estimates of z3, can I reconstruct alpha and beta, still assuming them to be constant, because then I'll use the same argument. Now the difficulty here is that if you're stabilizing the system, your input is going to go to zero. As the input goes to zero, z3 gives you no information about beta. So it becomes harder and harder to extract beta from your measurements. There's no information about beta there. And this makes the problem much harder. And in fact, this problem is a problem that has been studied in lack of control for 30 or 40 years. So what is known there, there are typically two approaches. We build something that looks like an observer, and there are two proof techniques that you can use. The first one is to say that we have persistency of excitation. What this means is that even though to stabilize the system we'd like the input to go to zero, we'll force it not to, not to go to zero. We'll superimpose some signal so that the measurements always carry information about the parameter beta. Now, the problem with that is that uh, there is uh, tension between your control objective and enforcing persistency of excitation. The other approach is to say that we won't have persistency of excitation. In that case, we can prove that the system will still stabilize, but the estimates will no longer converge to the true values of the parameters. Okay. Because we still want to stabilize and we achieve that, we're okay. But there's a problem. And the problem is that in the case of noise, those parameter estimates cannot be guaranteed to be bounded. So the observer drifts as there's less and less information, starts integrating noise, and then drifts away. And so if you go and look, in, look into the literature, there are all kinds of patches that were developed put on top of this to deal with the problem. We're going to use one of these, which is we're going to make some assumptions about beta that we know upper and lower bounds, and then we're going to restrict beta to live on the set, and therefore we, we get the bound. So there's no novelty there. OK, so the details. I assume the parameters to be constant. So pi contains both parameters alpha and beta. I design a Lumberger observer. There's some square root of t there just for technical reasons. Uh, same thing, this, uh, I design that this gain matrix gamma to make it stable. Stable means that I'll have a Lyapunov function whose decrease now, instead of being linear at here, I want to have a square root of t. Because the model was wrong, there's the modeling error that appears there. We can do some analysis and rewrite that modeling error in terms of the state and in terms of uh, the error in our estimate. We have our controller from before. Uh, now affected both by the modeling error as well as the error in the, in the parameter estimates. We use the bound that we had before. That's the expression we had. Uh, now we do the same argument as we had before. We say that, look, there's a t squared term here and there's a t term there. If I make t sufficiently small, this term dominates that. Same story here, there's a t term here, square root of t. If I make t sufficiently small, this term <coughs> dominates that. So for practical purposes, we can assume that those terms are not there. And now when you look at the system, you can see that these are two input, sta input state stable systems. 
And we can use something like a small gain theorem to show that when you put them together, you're still going to have something stable. So the end result is, you take a compact set of initial conditions, there will be a ball inside, so that if you start on that ball, you can guarantee the following. With no noise, the output converges to zero. I know it's derivatives. Uh, and the estimates of the parameters converge, but not necessarily to the true parameters. And all the signals remain bounded. In the presence of noise, then you have something similar, except that it will no longer converge to the origin. It's going to converge to a ball of the origin. And the size of this ball is proportional to the magnitude of the noise. Again, the same question. Would something like this work in practice? OK, so first, we did some simulations. We picked the well-known Tori example, which is an example that violates our uh, relative degree assumption. So here, I am controlling this force. I'm measuring the displacement. And if I were to compute the beta function that appears there, the beta function, instead of depending on x, which is what I'm measuring, depends on theta, which is part of the internal dynamics. So this is a system with internal dynamics, and therefore it's not feedback interest. So if we ask it to stabilize it at 1, you see that, yes, we achieve to, we, we are successful at achieving stabilization. And these plots show what happens as I increase the noise. You see that as I increase the noise, it hovers around what we want, so it gets trapped in a ball around the, the, the point that we want. This is just the same plots, but amplified, so that you can see that as I increase the noise by a factor of 10, I also increase the size of the ball by a factor of 10. So these are the parameters that we're trying to learn. So you see the, here that in the absence of noise, it converges. It did not converge to the true value. Well, in fact, in this case, there were, the true value was, was changing with a state variable that is not even part of the model. So this oscillatory signal is the true value of beta. So it converges to somewhere. But no, the system was still stabilized. In the presence of noise, you see that the estimate starts to drift. That's why we need to have this upper bound to make sure it remains bound. And if we do another example where the beta, so before the beta was bounded, this is unbounded. As x increases, the beta grows without bounds. We have similar plots. It converges. We can track trajectories. As the noise increases, performance gets a little bit worse. So now I'm going to show you experimental results. So let me explain what I'm going to show. And now this is now in my lab. So, so now I can claim that I also do experiments. So I stepped up to the next level. Uh, so we have a little drone on this uh, skateboard. My student is going to hit the skateboard with his foot. We're going to throw it into, into the air. And we have no model, no nothing. As it goes into the air, it learns the alpha and beta parameters and stabilizes the drone. Because the theory that I've explained is just for single input, single output systems, we have another controller stabilizing the drone on the horizontal plane. And we're just controlling altitude because now we have a single input, single output system. We're measuring distance to the ground, and we're controlling the thrust exerted by the propellers. So it learned as it was going up, stabilized. Now, of course, we're going to put some disturbances there. It put a motor, which amounts to about 25% of the weight. So we changed the model, we changed the mass. It recovered. It's, gonna, it's not going to try to smash it. It's just going to you know, create some draft to see how well it reacts to that. Poke it a little bit. And then it's going to go over a sequence of waypoints, progressive lower, lower, and then it's going to land. OK, I'm going to see if I can play this again while showing you some plots as well. So here we're just going to be seeing the uh, distance to the ground. And here are the waypoints that it goes through at the end. Um, and here we're going to be seeing the parameters that we're learning. Here is the beta parameter. Uh, so when it goes to the air, very quickly learns and stabilizes on this value. 
and this is the alpha parameter and you're going to see that the you know, alpha here is converting, stabilizing and then changing and these changes in the alpha they occur because of all the external disturbances. So the algorithm interprets this external disturbance as a change in the model and relearns a new model that lets it to stabilize again. And then we can correlate what happens in the video with those changes over there. So it went up, it's stabilizing, now it's going to put the weight there, so it changed the mass, he has to relearn, and so the parameter now drops a little bit and converges to that value. And then as disturbances come in, they're going to be interpreted as changes in the model, and the parameter gets adjusted again. And same thing here. These oscillations there in the parameter are um, an expl the explanation that the algorithm finds for these changes in the behavior. And then it just goes like that. OK, so is the feedback linearization assumption essential? It was convenient to construct the proof, but it's not really essential. I think this stopped working. Even this one stopped working. Oh, there you go. Um, so we can do partial feedback uh, linearization. So we'll have some internal dynamics. You just need to assume it's ISS and you know, no big deal. Um, as I mentioned, it's convenient for the proof, but the algorithm we're using does not really rely on that in an essential way. At the intuitive level, you can understand what we're doing as follows. We compute the best linear model that explains the data at that current state, use that model to compute an input, feed the input, and then again construct the best linear model that explains the data. And to do this, all we really need is that the models we're constructing, that they're stabilizable, so that there always is an input that stabilizes them. And then we need a strategy to explain why input stabilizing different models can be patched together to stabilize the original system. Before you see that linearization as the way of doing this, we may, use, may need a different argument, but I conjecture that this can also be done for any system whose linearization is stabilizable. Now, another way of understanding what we're doing is by drawing an analogy of when you're doing gradient descent and to find the minimum of a complex function. Do you need to globally know the function to find the minimum? No. At every point, you just need to know the function locally that's good enough to find the gradient, and then you follow the gradient. That's exactly what we're doing here. At every point, I just need to have enough local information to determine the direction I want to follow, I use that and I recompute my local information. Okay, so that's essentially what's taking place here. Now, here's a question for you to think about, and maybe we can discuss after. So we're so worried about these assumptions, feedback linearization, and will this be large enough class of systems? Will this be useful in practice? But at the end, this is a technique that lets you control a system for which you don't have a model. So how can you go and check your assumptions? If you don't know the model, how can you check if the model is feedback analyzable? So what's the point of worry, being worried about placing assumptions so that your theorem holds in scenarios when you're going to apply them and you're never going to be able to verify or check your assumptions? Uh, well, no. We can discuss about this uh, later. Um, so let's go back to, to this autonomy that, uh, that was motivating this. So can we use data-driven control to bypass the need for machine learning in the perception pipeline. And let's do the following thought experiment. So I have a robot and I want the robot to move along, along a corridor and somehow he's able to measure the distance to the walls. It could be with a camera, it could be with infrared, it doesn't matter what it is. Now, can we control this system without understanding the sensor that is providing us the data and without having the model? Well, this is what data-driven control does for you. So in this case, I have two distances, one to the wall on the right and the left. I need to transform them into a single scalar. Uh, so these are distances D1 and D2. We transform them into a single scalar like this. Now, later, if you want, I can explain why the curve bends the way it bends. But now I have an input or an output. My input is how much do I steer to the, to the right or to the left. And then if I use data-driven control, I'll be able to force this car to move along the lane. 
Now, in doing this, I don't even know which sensor I'm using. I don't even know who is giving me information about distance. I don't need to know. I can completely bypass the perception pipeline and control the system, and I couldn't care less about this. Now, when can we do something like this? We can do something like this when the specification we care for is easy to state in the space of the signals we can measure. This was the case. It's easy to say that, for example, if I equalize the distance, the line will be center. Sometimes that's something easy to do, sometimes that's something more complicated to do. So clearly for the human, it's easier to talk about the space of people and avoiding pedestrians and bicycles rather than talking about LiDAR signals. But there are many examples of problems where you can actually put the specification closer to the signals you measure, and therefore you obviate the need to try to reconstruct the state. So here's another thought experiment we did. Uh, let me see if I can move forward. Oops. OK, so we wanted to have this robot moving parallel to the wall. And we assume that now we are still measuring two distances, but the distances are measured in this way to the outside wall. And we wanted like, the, the robot to track this blue line. And we did the same thing. We transformed these two distances into a scalar. We gave it to our algorithm. And you see that the car will start converging to that line that, that he wants to track. Except that in the corners, it takes a while for him to detect that there's an obstacle in front. So it goes a little bit outside, and then it converges. So there are many simple specifications you can directly write in terms of the measurement space. And you completely obviate the need to describe the dynamics, describe the sensors. And you don't need to worry about any of that. And even though you're controlling a nonlinear system, you use linear systems. And there's no prior data, no prior training. So do we need a model? I just showed you examples where I control systems without the model. I didn't even model the, the perception of the sensor. So I could tell you that, no, we have certain classes of models that are almost universal, feedback linearizable, the well-defined relative degree, controllable linearizations, and we lump all the non-linearities into just a few parameters, we get them from data, and we're ready to go. We don't really need a model. So I could give you that answer. I could also tell you that we do need a model. Why? Because what I was doing was computing derivatives of a signal that I measured. And if there's noise on that signal, computing derivatives is an ill post problem. Okay? So this works to the extent that you can manage the noise that you have. And so any extra assumption you have available that helps you in minimizing the influence of the noise is going to help you. And for sure, you want to use it. So the answer is, well, before going there. So if you take a behavioral systems perspective, data is your model. Yeah, the behaviors is your model. So you don't really need the set of equations. All you need is good data. Of course, if data is tainted with noise, you don't have a good model. So noise is your enemy. So the, the real answer is we probably need both. There are assumptions that right now we are making that we don't need. And that's what explains examples like the one in the satellite where things went wrong. There were all assumptions that were baked in. They were not satisfied. And for that reason, the system failed. Um, but the less quality your measurements have, the more you're going to have to rely on on uh, your model in order to be able to control the system. So it's really a mix between the two, and it's really not clear how you make this judicious decision about which knowledge about your system is you should use in your design, and which one you should leave out and use adaptation or learning to handle those parts. So with this, I would like to thank you all for coming to my talk, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Yes. When I was listening to your talk, I was thinking of your previous talk uh, you gave last time. So have you thought about like getting measurements that uh, give it by, let's say, uh, adversary or something, and uh, when you, in, in you're thinking about this kind of thing? Uh, yeah, so to, to give context, the, the, the talk he's referring to is one where I was looking at the problem of controlling a system where the sensors are under attack. So I could not rely on the sensor measurements. And there I was using the model to 
to identify which sensors were lying. But now, if I don't have a model, what can I rely on? So we, we looked at the following problem. Can I do system identification, so I don't have a model? Can I build a model from data whenever some sensors are under attack? And the answer is, you cannot build a model. You're going to build a family of models. You cannot distinguish between them, because the attacker will always be able to confuse you. But those systems have the property that I can always stabilize them, even though I got the wrong model. Now, in terms of performance, there's a problem, because if I pick the wrong one, performance will be terrible. But the asymptotic behavior I can control, the transient behavior can be terrible if I'm using the wrong one. So it's kind of, there is kind of a mixed message that I can still stabilize, but performance could be very bad because the adversary can fool me into learning it, uh, the wrong model. So we have some superficial understanding, I would say. So I'm going to play a bit of a devil's advocate here, but uh, <clears throat> the class that you described, at least in the example, is you know single input, single output, minimum phase systems. Mm -hmm. Is the class that we already know, these are, that's the good stuff that we know how to do in a variety of ways, including model reference data and control. No, but, no, because it's not linear, it's non-linear. Still, so in I adaptive do. control, Either you do the linear case or the nonlinear case, you take the nonlinearities and you linearly parameterize the back constants. Yeah. Here I'm not doing any parameterization. So this is, so you can see this as adaptive control and just doing this very small observation that says everything that was done in adaptive control can also be done in the case where I don't have a parameterization of the nonlinearities. Understood. But what I'm saying is the single input, single outputness and the minimum phaseness, especially, is doing a lot of work here. So, yeah, you can do multiple input, multiple, I mean, conceptually is the same thing. You can have zero dynamics. There, if zero dynamics is unstable, then if there's nothing you can do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if it's ISS, the same thing goes through. So, in terms of the class, no, I'm not really identifying um, any new class for which you can do more. I'm just saying that. Before, you could handle this class very well with models. Now, you can also handle it very well without models. The other thing is, can you get a, like a quantifiable? Because a lot depends on whether you can cancel them. Mm -hmm. I know these stories, you know, when feedback linearization was just beginning yes. in the late 80s, I remember I had heard stories where you know, John right. would make up these very simple, trivial counterexamples where things would work well when it's a default, but tiny bit of noise will make it yes. horrendously ill conditioned. So this is, this, that's the argument that advocates on behalf of adaptive control, where you say, I'm not going to rely on my model, I'll actually adjust the parameter I'm canceling based on the data I have to make sure I have a better cancellation. But the problem with adaptive control, at least from the history I remember, and my history is a bit biased because of my training, but there was no robust, nice robustness theory. Yes. So, so there, there is the later. So I did not describe. I'm not using those techniques here. There is. I'm also not precise about the timeline, but after the mid '90s, Morse came up with the switching adaptive control. So that one gives robustness properties. It has a different set of disadvantages. Yeah, the transients are pretty bad. Which is. You make this assumption that you have a family of controllers that covers the space, and you, you know you may not know how to get it. But the other one, in the at least in the linear case, you can still have a simplified bank of observers. In the nonlinear case, this bank of observers can get really <coughs> large. So the complexity of implementing them is, is quite large. Uh, but there is robustness. Well, I think related to robustness also. I think another way is going from FBLC to sliding control. Mm, yes. Where you have a lot of you know fast power atomic switching and I work in power areas. Yes. So you want to shape something that evolves at the rate of ten but you switch much faster at yes. this level. And so do you have any sense how data based model helps you? Well, sliding mode control versus feedback analysis control for robustness issues. In particular, in the zero dynamics, sometimes you have a multiple equilibria right, inside. And have you developed any insights? I never thought about that. Uh, 
it's interesting because usually the key argument here is like a time scale separation. There as well, that you're switching much faster, and then you look at the slower behavior, you can approximate that slide on the manifold. How does the, okay, you understand that the model based setting? Is anybody working in the data? In no. the database setting, you understand no. how switching versus continuous decisions? Yeah. I've not I've not come across any paper where they're looking into this. Okay. No. Okay. Um, now, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, I'm uh, playing this dubious game here that I say data. So I, I say database, but I never said model free. Yeah. Because implicitly there's a model there saying that it's feedback generalizable. It's implicitly I'm saying that I know something about the model. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a model there, but so I'll prefer to say database because you know data is your model, so there's still a model there. Uh, you gave an analogy <coughs> uh, to the local gradient. Now, one issue with the local gradient is you can get stuck. Okay, good point. And, and, and good point. So, in what you're doing. I would assume you could also get stuck. Yes. So the, in optimization, you'd use convexity right, to get around that problem. Here, what plays the role of convexity is feedback linear, uh, linearizability. So feedback linearizability was what I used in the proof to show that if you take a sequence of local decisions, it's guaranteed to converge to the origin. So that was a technical argument I used. I don't see uh, any relationship between feedback and analysability and convexity per se, uh, but they play the same role in the proof, in establishing that from local knowledge, I can say something global. Okay, but, but you, you have then global feedback linearizability. Yes, or in the region where I'm working. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So. That's a, that's a fairly strong condition. I mean, so is convexity. So, so. so my conjecture is that we can replace that with the linearization of the system being stabilizable at every point in the domain where you're working. So how would that compare with feedback linearizability? Let's say it's controllable. That the relative degree now could change depending on where you are. So that's much more challenging because, uh, let's say, that the number of states needed to describe the system depend from where you are. But I, my conjecture is that it should still be possible to prove the same type of result under those assumptions. Which is so another argument. So just for the audience to understand the, the question a bit better, you can ask if I take the class of nonlinear systems. Uh, what's the size of the systems that are feedback linearizable? Mm -hmm. And mathematically, you could say zero measure, thin, very, very small, because they have to satisfy these algebraic equalities, and therefore it's going to be a small set. Pragmatically speaking, it has been observed that many of the systems we're interested in practice, they fall into that class. So uh, how general it is, it's a bit unclear because there's this mismatch between a mathematical answer and what you see in practice. Didn't need the first. One. I mean, yeah, no, just in case the audience is not familiar with feedback and revision or just doing it. Yes. So assuming that the hence derivative is a state independent, isn't that implicitly assuming that you know the border? Yes. In the sense of system identification. Yes. So in practice, all we need to know is an upper bound. We don't really need to know it exactly. We need to know an upper bound. Why? Because then we can search through models of different order and try to see which one explains better. The thing. And in fact, not knowing these was one of the examples that was used in adaptive control to show lack of robustness. That example was. You design a controller for a first order transfer function, you pick a second order transfer function that is very, very close to this one, but the fact there was a mismatch in the relative degree, that's what was used to show that there were finite explosion time. So what you're talking about is also a bit reminiscent of sort of gain scheduling in some Yes. Way. 
because it's kind of like saying, I'm, I know where I am now, locally, this is a good model, and then, um, so the difference there is at least in like these quasi MPE settings, the stuff that Jeff Shaw or I were doing uh, in, in the 90s, you could, you could also calculate the performance. Is there anything here that you can say, well, what is sort of like, what if I knew the model, this would be the cause, and how the optimal, and can you sort of, is so, there a way to quantify what the performance is? So rather I, than just sit saying this is stable? No, I can tell you the performance because I can tell you the closed loop exactly. I designed the closed loop exactly. Now, what I cannot tell you, and that is the key, is the sample rate. The result just says there's a sufficiently small sample rate that will make this work. But if I want to give you an estimate of the sample rate, I'll need to add a model so that I estimate the effect of this is mismatch and that mismatch. So to get bounds, I'll need the model. Without the model, I can tell you there exists a sufficiently small sample time, but then you have to go experimentally and play with the field to see what you can do. How would you answer the noise? Uh, so the results include the case of noise. In the, when you have noise, what happens is that instead of converging to the equilibrium, you converge to a ball around the equilibrium. And the magnitude of the ball depends on the size of the noise. But it depends on the character of the noise. Yeah, in the analysis, we just looked at the upper bound of the noise. So no statistical assumptions on the noise. Probably one can also do some statistical analysis. Oh, yes, sir. Um, I'm a little curious if you've ever compared this to other black box control methods like extreme seeking or uh, active disturbance rejection control. So I thought about comparing it with extreme seeking. So, uh, I, to my knowledge, only recently extreme seeking has been used for stabilization. I think Miroslav Krisik and a few papers on how to do that. But there, the starting assumption is that. So, regular extreme seeking, you say there's an output, and this output is the cost, and you minimize the cost. So, you, uh, you excite the system in a, in a certain way that you estimate the gradient, <coughs> and you try to, try to minimize this cost. And then he changed it, and he said, what if my output is actually a control the outcome function? Then, because it's a control the outcome function, I know that it's an input that drives it to zero, so if my algorithm drives it to zero, I'm good to go. But how do I? Postulate how do I come up with the control the atomic function without having the model? So I think there's a paper of Killingsworth and Miroslav Kristich that is sort of it's a PID controller where the gains are tuned via extreme of seeking, which is completely black box. But I <coughs> need the assumption that you are, you know that the PID controller stabilizes that system. And uh, now, recently, people have been doing data-driven control uh, based on the behavioral approach. Where you say, I'm just going to collect, let's assume this is the model, data. I'm just going to collect data, put it on the Henkel matrix, and then I say, uh, you know that the image of the Henkel matrix gives you all possible trajectories of your system, so you ask, which input should I use so that in the next time step, such and such is going to happen. If it's linear, there's always a Lyapunov really function you can pick, which is because of controllability, you knowing n steps you can go to the origin, so you do something like MPC. But you do this directly from data. You take data, put it on the Henkel matrix, and then you solve the MPC just with the data, and you get the input. But if it's non linear again, I don't know which cost to pick. I don't have the guarantee that there exists a cost such that if I minimize that cost, I stabilize the system. So that there's all. Now, here the way I get around is to say it's repeatedizable. Okay. Then I know, I mean, of course, you need to assume something, uh, but that's where some of these techniques, they start to, I think it, it's fine. They, they, they basically decompose the problem in two problems. How do you get this ingredient? If you have this ingredient, my technique will do the rest of the work, and they leave to you the job of getting that ingredient, either the cost or the control. So uh, if there are, uh, go ahead. I was just wondering, uh, can you get to the equilibrium cluster by increasing the centigrade? We, we, we specify what the, what the closed loop behavior is going to be, so we can put a more aggressive controller if we want. We don't need to pick the sample rate faster for that. So when you, when you achieve some 
Okay, let's choose some sample grade, then arbitrarily increasing that sample grade doesn't change it. That um, qualitatively would not change anything. So if there are no more questions, let's thank <laughs> 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 The sensors on the skateboard of the UAV, what kind and where they are? So we have a camera system, and we're using the camera system oh, to... A fancy one. Yeah, we were worried about noise. Uh, so we also have a, a beacon system, but the beacon system gives us an uncertainty in our lab around 5 centimeters. So I mean, we cannot do an experiment. If the error, without trying to estimate derivatives already 5 centimeters, then if we try to estimate derivatives, it would be terrible. So that's why we use the camera. Let's thank for serving.